Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I think we're on time at 4.30. I'm Christopher Tate from Connect Free Corporation. And today we're here to talk about Internet 3 and Internet based on 21st century principles. Um, and today, hopefully together, we are going to reinvent the Internet. That's a big thing to talk about, reinventing the Internet. What does that mean? Well, first we need to think about how the economy works. I think that the first Internet really worked well because it fit with the um, economic trends at the time. Obviously, um, if something doesn't work economically, then it's really hard for a lot of integrators and people to connect to. But if we think about the economy, go back to basics, um, like uh, Economy 101, we think about goods and services. And um, really, we have to think about what is a good, right? A good is something that usually some sort of specialized manufacturer or entity creates. Uh, and then you know, it could be bought or sold. And um, obviously, usually you think about a good when you buy it, that um, you get to own it. You get to own the, the goods that, you, that are made for you that you, you purchase. On the other hand, services are kind of another unique kind of thing. It's something, you know, I traditionally think of services, something like, you know, maybe I want to eat a hamburger. Instead of going to the supermarket and buying lettuce and tomatoes and uh, you know, the, the meat, you know, if you're a meat eater, and the, 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 the bun, um, you might want to go to a, a company called McDonald's, you know, a shop called McDonald's and buy a, a hamburger. Or you know, instead of managing your own wealth or managing your own cash, you want to maybe keep it safe in a bank, have them do it for you. Or even um, maybe you don't have the time to clean your suit or clean your clothes, so you end up uh, you know, contracting the services of a dry cleaner. So these are usually things, when you think about services, we really think of services as something that you can do yourself, but you choose not to because you either have the luxury to do so or it's economically viable for you to do so. And so that really kind of brings the question about, well, what about internet services? Uh, you know, internet services, are they the same thing? Um, can, is internet service something you can do yourself? What about internet services? And so we really have to think about um, really kind of the core of internet services, the internet service provider. And so historically speaking, the internet was not really for everyone. Um, it was built mainly for the government uh, and later research organizations. And it was not immediately understood that everyone would be able to connect. This is not something that really we think everyone would be connecting to. It was mainly, again, to reiterate for governments and uh, research. But then the advent of the personal computer kind of changed a lot of things. And obviously, the cheap, cheaper modems got so you could use the existing telecom infrastructure. And we saw the rise of something called the computer bulletin board. Um, and really, these, these computer bulletin boards, um, these BBSs required administration and a central phone to connect to. Uh, and then eventually, some entrepreneurs realized that they could further centralize the system nationwide. So instead of having a BBS that you, your friend or your friend or a friend connects to or uh, creates for you, um, you know, the idea would be that you would have um, companies that would provide the centralization to do this nationwide. And so this was the birth of the online service provider, or um, instead of an ISP, what we say the OSP. And so these OSPs uh, sold monthly subscriptions to access their systems. Um, normally, you know, you'd want to have like, uh, access to uh, a newspaper or access to a television uh, you know, subscription or, uh, or magazine. And so this is kind of the thought process that there was a resource of information uh, uh, somewhere not in front of you, something you need to dial into, a monthly subscription. And so as we are well known today, some of these in the US were CompuServe and later a AOL. Um, but then, you know, as we still think about it, traditionally, these are still a service. Theoretically, they're still a service. If you really wanted to, you could still set up your own BBS uh, independently. Who wants to do that? So it would be great to say, OK, CompuServe, OK, OL, why don't you do that for us? Why don't you create the connective service for us? It still meant, meant, made sense that, um, that there's these companies that would do something um, like creating these uh, BBSs for you instead of you doing it yourself or having someone in your community do it for you. But then in, the 19, uh, in 1991 specifically, with the backing of the White House, the internet, which was then known as the NFS Net, which is uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, Foundation, finally opened up uh, access to commercial entities. And this is great. This meant that uh, not only the entrenched you know, uh, 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 government and re research entities um, would use the internet, but also commercial entities as well. And so obviously, what took place afterward was a rush, a land rush, to obtain uh, as many IP addresses as one could get. Apple to this day, not to, to hold on Apple, I mean, they did something great. You know, they, they decided they wanted to get uh, space, so they got a whole block, a whole eight block of, 
of, um, of IP space. And even today, uh, Amazon Web Services owns 1.7% of the uh, IPv4 address space, which is around se you know, uh, 73 million addresses, quite a lot of addresses. Now, um, really, what comes next is that there's a lot of uh, industrious entrepreneurs, like the entrepreneurs uh, that created the BBSs, um, uh, the OSPs, that realized that they could sell a monthly subscription to access the internet itself. And so uh, I pulled this from the, from, uh, the uh, Wikipedia on the internet. And you can see here there's something kind of weird is that the internet's all the way up there. And you've got tier three networks and all these networks and stuff, but the internet is way above. And where are the customers? The customers are not in the internet. They're down the bottom. They're kind of tethered onto the internet. They're not in the internet. They're just kind of accessing the internet. I think this is a fundamental problem. I think this, this is kind of interesting, you know, pulling up the Wikipedia and it was such an interesting um, image for me because really you are not an internet user. You're an internet subscriber. Um, there's a distinction. And, and so ISPs should be called internet subscription providers. Uh, so, so as long as IP addresses are centralized, uh, we think, I think that uh, so too is the internet. And that's unfortunate. And so getting to the internet we want, which is kind of the theme here that we have today uh, at the IGF. And um, really, you know, the internet that we want is unfortunately not the internet that we currently have. We find that we want more from the internet than what the internet can provide, uh, currently provide to us. And um, believe it or not, uh, if you were to place the word internet with electric uh, grid 100 years ago, uh, you'd probably have the same thing happening uh, what we have today, the, the electric grid that we want, per se. And so um, this is interesting because just like the internet, the electric grid is very dangerous. It's a dangerous thing. If you connect, you know, touch directly to the electric grid, you might get shocked. Before the uh, invention of the, the socket, the only option to repair light bulbs was to call an electric company who would send an electrician. This might be very hard to believe, but again, 100 years ago, different uh, time, different technologies, um, you know, there were people that were connecting electric grid directly to the light bulbs in these houses. And so here in Japan, uh, a gentleman by the name of Konosuke Matsushita, he was one of those electricians. And he realized that um, you know, an invention, a socket, would allow, us, uh, allow anyone to change their light bulbs independently of electricians. And so, um, you know, as the story goes, and it's a, it is a story, there's, you know, obviously you go to the uh, museum inside of Panasonic's headquarters, you know, they've got a whole section, a whole corner of it, but basically his superiors balked at the idea that, a common, that the common folk, common people, uh, would work with dangerous light bulbs. Who would want to do that? Who would want to, you know, work on that? That's, that's dangerous. And they even uh, propositalized that, that they might even lose their jobs to uh, commercialization, that if anybody could change a light bulb, what would happen to me? What, what, what would happen to my job? And, and so he thought of these, he thought of both sides. He thought, well, he thought of his colleagues. You know, I, I don't want people to lose their jobs. But then again, he thought about the rural side of Japan. There's so many places in Japan that can benefit from electricity, can, can benefit from these innovations. But unless um, they can create a world that doesn't need uh, direct electricians to, uh, to change the light bulb, then um, you know, the, his hopes would not happen. So he founded Panasonic. And today, uh, they make very many useful products that everyone can use at their leisure at any time. And so uh, the internet, like early, the electric, uh, electric grid, still requires professionals to work uh, to its full extent. And um, unfortunately, if configured incorrectly, the internet can be hacked, filtered, and redirected. Um, these are all things that we work with. You know, I think a lot of the people here at this uh, IGF, you know, we're in our different work groups and we're all talking about these different things. And so, although the current internet has enabled economic opportunities for billions of people, um, it also fundamentally hinders the future of our modern economy. And so what do I mean by that? Well, I've got four different things here. The first is, without encryption and authentication at its core, cyberspace is less of a trustworthy society and more or less the wild west of our modern economy. Number two, the internet architecture places too much power in the hands of network administrators who can be coerced by bad actors or, rep uh, or repressive governments to shut down networks or filter information. We've seen this a lot uh, around the world. There's a lot of news about it. You know, something happens, war breaks out, and then all of a sudden the internet goes down. <laughs> Can't connect anymore. 
you know, this is, uh, this is a really hard thing to work through. And so obviously because um, the way that the, the current, you know, architecture works, you know, it's really easy to, even if there's good intending people at these, net, these, these ISPs and these institutions, you need to put a gun to someone's head and, the, you know, it changes. Um, third, the governments and corporations uh, that, you know, currently utilize this stuff, they, um, they're forced into this kind of idea of private networks. Um, which in turn limits our innovation and economic freedoms by creating closed networks in the name of security. Um, here in Japan, especially, there's a lot of carriers who are well-meaning. You know, no one's bad. No one's, you know, uh, doing bad things. But at the same time, they are uh, marketing these closed networks to their clients that you can have a closed network, a closed 4G, 5G network um, that connects directly to, um, you know, the cloud. And the problem with this is that it, again, further limits the access to the internet, right? You want to have so much connectivity to all these different devices and different services, but we end up seeing a lot of, um, uh, a lot of carriers in the name of, of um, security closing down the networks when we should be keeping them open. And fourth, politically rev uh, repressive governments have been hijacking uh, Western technology uh, and are rapidly extending it to create digital authoritarian ecosystems. Uh, this is a lot of keywords here, but basically, you know, people are using the internet that we invented in America, uh, the land of the, the home, uh, land of the free, and the home of the brave, and uh, using it to do things that are not, um, you know, let's say, uh, in the name of freedom. And so, uh, instead of uh, relying on a few network engineers that we have, the question really becomes: Why not make an internet that anyone can securely operate anywhere? This should be a no-brainer. I'm going to say it again: Instead of relying on the few network engineers that we have, why not make an internet that anyone can securely operate anywhere? And so that's internet three. Internet three is an internet that works, you want to clap there? That's great, you to, we haven't, haven't presented you here. The internet, it's an internet that works like a good instead of a service. Instead of buying access to the internet, you are the internet, and so am I. Instead of relying on network engineers, software, the software that, that the Internet 3 uh, is based on autonomously maintains connectivity at all times through all interfaces. So normally uh, what this means is that when you get an IP address, it's usually in one interface, you're connecting to uh, Wi-Fi in a cafe shop, well, you've got the Wi-Fi's cafe shop's IP address. And you might have the IP address uh, of, you know, maybe your, your um, your phone that you're tethered to, right? So a computer today, unfortunately, has so many different IP addresses, uh, different connectors, but uh, instead we want to autonomous do that. So then, instead of fearing connection, Internet 3 allows you to welcome it, right? We get this a lot um, in the corporate world. You know, if you go to, um, you know, maybe your partner's office, a different corporate partner's office, and they've got the Ethernet cable out on the table, and you're tempted to use it, and then, you know, he says, no, please don't use our Internet because our network administration says you shouldn't do that. And so we want to create uh, you know, an internet where everyone is connected at all times. Just like the, just like the, the electric, uh, you know, we've got these electric cables here on our desk right here, right? We just you know, plug into it, have fun with the electricity. Well, we should have the same thing with the internet. And so really the fundamental change is how you get your IP address, right? Um, you know, a corporate network, you want to maintain that you know, the own your, own your corporate people are having IP address. So, we see this as a really big problem. Who, who owns the, the IP address? And so um, the internet was born in a world where computational power was limited and quite expensive. I mean, we're talking about mainframes, right? And then we had, um, you know, generally started getting in the direction of the personal computer, but it really wasn't until, um, you know, Apple came along and others came along that allowed us to think about, you know, computers in terms of personalized power. Um, but uh, again, Computers were good at moving data and not calculating math. And so um, we really see a fundamental change uh, in the 1990s. Um, but unfortunately, the export laws uh, limited how math and cryptographic prim primitives could cross borders. So um, you know, we have the technology to do a lot of security. But unfortunately, uh, we were worried about how this, uh, this technology would place in, in others' hands. And so by the end of the 20th century, the internet had um, a second uh, protocol implementation, as we know it today, by IPv6, but it continued to remain tied to an, in, uh, to an address registry. Yes. And so this changes today with Internet 3. Um, inside of, inside of uh, most smartphones, probably most everyone's smartphones here sitting today, there is something called a trusted pl uh, platform module, or TPM. 
Uh, Apple likes to say that it's called the uh, secure enclave. And um, when you watch a Hollywood, Hollywood movie or download an app from an app store on your phone, the content you receive is cryptographically signed so that only your phone can use it. You know, we call this DRM, which is normally when you think about it, kind of, it's not a, a really happy technology, it's kind of a clothing technology, but the flip side is that Internet 3 can utilize this TPM in a completely new revolutionary, revolutionary way um, that changes the game. So instead of asking the network for your IP address, who am I, Internet 3 uh, software asks the TPM to generate a public key that maps to an IPv6 address. Um, and so, uh, specifically, because you know this is a broad claim to make, you know what, what are you doing? Specifically, we generate a curve two five five one nine public key and cryptographically hash it into an IP six address. So, what does this mean? It means that when you're connecting to another node and you talk to the node, uh, normally what would happen uh, inside the browser happens at the protocol layer, and because every node on Internet three has this public key, you exchange public keys uh, and are able to ascertain not only uh, who the other party is, but the other party can ascertain who you are. Uh, not in terms of a privacy uh, data span point, but actually as more of a, um, more as a kind of a, a specific kind of physical property of the network, right? So obviously here we have DNA and we have our faces and our fingerprints. Um, you don't know who someone is, but you do know what they look like. And so in the, on the same way, every device on Internet 3 knows what they look like. So this is kind of a, a rough, uh, kind of uh, illustration here. So you have the trust module inside of the computer, and then that has a secure public key. And from that secure public key, we hash that into an authenticated IP address that you can use and share. And because it's backwards compatible with IPv6, all of the applications of, on, on top of uh, Internet 3 work just like they did before. So um, we're completely backwards compatible with all of the I, uh, IETF protocols uh, above layer 3. So that means TCP. Uh, that means all the other application suites, it means email. All the applications that you like and love today, they become automatically encrypted and authenticated. Uh, and we think that this is a, a great uh, trend to create. So this means that without any public key infrastructure at all, we can create an internet that is not only 100% encrypted, but also 100% authenticated. And I think that this is kind of the, the crux of, of what, um, what we really need. And so, um, you know, there's, there's uh, so much to get into. You know, I've spent 12 years of my life, uh, and our company has been around for 12 years to, um, to really kind of work this through. Um, you know, it works over existing layer two, so you know, any kind of physical layer that you've got, you can still use today. It's always authenticated IP addressing, so instead of having, um, you know, uh, if you go to a website and uh, you know, put a username and password, the, the website knows who you are, and you know that you're connected to the website. It works, again, to reiterate with existing software, so anything that, that speaks IPv6, um, you know, you can put it on top of uh, Internet 3. And then again, it's software-defined networks, so that's networking, which means that you don't have to go get another switch or a router or some sort of other hardware or thingamajig to plug into your computer. Um, it's software, you download it, it works. And again, uh, to reiterate, uh, it's, um, a patent, it's a patent solution. We've been working on this for over 10 years, so we've been lucky to get some very core patents. So um, you can see that where a lot of security is up at layer 7 and it's hit and miss, Internet 3 integrates uh, internet uh, security and encryption and authentication at layer 3. Um, and so in that way, anything, anything above there is completely secure. And so seeing is believing. So I wanted to show you guys kind of a demonstration of it running. So I'll walk around here to the computer. I was expecting a stage, right? Because you have a launch event. You think you have a stage. But I like this format, too. It allows us to be more together. So I'm going to switch over here. and I. I apologize if, uh, you know, in order to accommodate some of the, the infrastructure here. So this is, um, this is one of the applications. So again, this is uh, Safari um, by Apple. And you'll notice that it's not, we haven't changed Safari anyway. You know, it's, um, it's Safari version 17. And um, you'll see that at the top here, I've got an IP address. Now this IP address is um, a little bit special. It starts with um, FC. And that is a special range inside of the IPv6 um, mandate where uh, it's called a site local uh, address, which means that the site local administrator can do whatever they want with that address space. And so we, again, hash our IP, our, our public key into this uh, IP space. And so we can create IP addresses that don't conflict with the current internet. So again, this is internet three. Um, we can use the, you know, I can, I can go to Google here. I'm not going through VPN. I'm not using any kind of things. You know, it's, um, 
It's completely uh, backwards compatible with things, but it doesn't, it doesn't mess up your current internet connectivity. So it's, a, it's, additive, it's an additive solution. It's not that you have to um, use Internet 3 or not. Um, you can use Internet 3 and you can use the existing internet simultaneously. And so this demonstration I've got, it's kind of a cute um, little uh, uh, website here that I've got here. And this was, this was actually made by a couple of high school students at the Fukui uh, Technical High School. And what is this thing here? Well, it's, um, it is what, uh, it's a little web application here that's running on a Raspberry Pi uh, inside of our offices in Fukui picture, Prefecture. And right now, uh, it's kind of hard to see me. I'll zoom up here. We are opening the door, the main security gate to our offices in Fukui over uh, Internet 3. And so um, what's kind of special here, I'm going to stop it here because I don't want to go too far. Maybe uh, let the cats and dogs in here. Uh, <laughs> Um, what's really special about this is that uh, we have a special uh, arrangement with NTT that allows us to um, use their, their fiber optic network without having ISP built into it. So right now, um, here in Fukui, this, this um, property doesn't have an ISP registered, registered. We don't have any kind of ISP services there. It's just a, a fiber optic line from uh, the NTT network. And then somewhere in the border of NTT's network and uh, this internet network, we have a uh, another Internet 3 node, which is re re uh, relaying this traffic with the NTT network. And this is, again, um, all done kind of in a P2P uh, uh, fashion. And so um, what's great about this is that, again, if I'm going to switch to the administration page here, you'll see that these, it's, you know, simply, simple application made by high school students. There's a security tab here, and you can see that there's these different IP addresses. So this is my IP address right here. So if I comment this out, if I comment this out here and then hit deploy, you'll notice that if I refresh the page, it says permission denied. And so this is really important because it means that I can control who accesses what, what resources simply by uh, what IP address I own. So if you want to do this with you know, public keys and TLS and all this stuff, um, it requires real knowledge of security primitives. But with Internet 3, it's just a simple string that you have to match. So as long as I match, I'm gonna re I'm gonna, I want to close the door, so I'm going to redeploy here. <laughs> and so um, we reconnect here, and then I'm going to press the down button here, uh, and then I'm going to close the door. And so um, what this means is that without using the cloud at all, uh, we can just correct, connect to all of these devices on these high-speed networks. Um, most of the phones in everyone's pockets here, you know, they're on the 5G network, right? And they're running 24 hours a day, and you plug them in a charge night, and they have multiple gigabytes of storage and they have all the photos and the data that you want to share with your friends. Why not have an IP address on your phone that you can connect to? Why can't your phone be a server? These are the kind of questions that we ask ourselves every day at Connect Free. And I just want to show you for the technical people here. So if I do a net stat, uh, which is kind of shows the, the local network table of this machine, you'll notice that how we implement it is that there is a rule in the uh, network table that says anything that starts with FC, send it to um, this virtual uh, network um, network adapter, and if I pull up the, the virtual network adapter, you can see that the, this, this IP address is generated from the public key is there. And so um, some other things that you can do with this. Obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of software that runs on IPv6. So for instance, um, if you look at, for instance, um, maybe before we connect here, let me open up the setting. So this is the IP address, the, uh, the uh, Internet 3 IP address of this Windows server that we've got. And of course, um, Internet 3 runs on Windows as well. And so if we, if we uh, connect here, you'll notice that uh, I'm on a Mac here, but I'm connecting to Windows machine. Uh, and then if I set up, uh, if I, let me see here, if I um, open up the network, uh, the network uh, control panel here for uh, network uh, adapters, you can see, and if my, my antivirus loads here, okay, let me pull it over side here. Yeah, so if, you, if we pull up, you know, you can see that again, the Internet 3 IP address has been assigned to this, ad this adapter. This is a uh, virtual network adapter. So, so to the operating system and to the applications, nothing is new. You know, you've got an, an IP address that you can use, and we can tell your friends, hey, this is my IP address, and, and you can control it with a normal firewall as well. So again, you know, going back, I'm going to go back into my, my um, so again, you know, again, this is, this is working. So this, it's not, like, so, so, so kind of the, the cool thing about this is that it's working the way it should be, but all of this has been encrypted and authenticated, which is great. So it's, it's not uh, like it's, it's such an additive technology, but there's no cost to do any of this, right? You just install it and it works. 
which is the way it should be. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to my presentation here and kind of get more into talking about, and I apologize, there's a lot of, lot of words on this slide, I apologize. So basically, you're going to hear a lot uh, here today at IGF about something called DFFT, Data Free Flow with Trust. What is that? What does that mean? And the late uh, Prime Minister Abe um, presented at Davos in 2004, uh, 2019 um, to the G20 group that um, really the internet needs to be, um, in one way, uh, more accepting to data flow, but in another way, having more uh, to do with trust. And so, um, again, I apologize, it's a lot on the slide there, but um, really, the question we also kind of ask ourselves, why do we still trust the, uh, the telephone system, right? Well, because all of the applications on, top, on your phone, like SMS and, and voice, and even um, you know, here in Japan, we still use fax machines a lot, this is all authenticated by the network layer. The telephone company asserts that the telephone number is gonna be trustworthy. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the internet itself, there's a lot of people like uh, blockchain and Web3 and these other um, uh, well-to-do people that are trying to do something on top of the internet, but really the, the problem is that by trying to reinvent trust on top of the internet, you're still having to deal with the cost of the internet itself. What that means is that even though, yeah, yeah even, though, even though you're trying to do something better for the internet, right, and try to help people, um, you're still having to um, work with the tremendous cost of the internet itself. So Internet 3 gets around that by providing trust from the device layer. So because each Internet 3 device is a router, is routing uh, secure data um, for other devices, um, you're able to get all command control and communication applications uh, in, a, in a, a way of, of trust, right? That everything can have trust. It's not just one application. It's not um, just one computer. It's, it's all computers and all applications. And so I'm kind of moving into, into the weeds here a little bit. Um, you're also going to hear, hopefully, more about something called zero trust. And zero trust is a specification uh, defined by the United States uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, and this is very important because of what it means is instead of having these local networks, we redefine the way network security is by saying that we shouldn't trust anyone to begin with and only trust the connections uh, that, we, that, we, um, that we are able to trust. And so why Internet 3 plays a huge, important um, uh, role into how um, zero trust will go forward and how uh, communication will go forward is because every computer is authenticated by the public key that is inside of the computer. Um, when a packet comes into the other uh, uh, application, right, so if you're connecting to another application, immediately that application knows that this IP address is definitely coming from whatever computer it's coming from. Now, they don't know what name the computer is or the user is. They don't have any of this, this privacy information. Just like I'm looking around the room and there are some new faces and there's some old faces, right? Uh, I don't know everyone's name here, but I can look in everyone's direction. I can see who you are. You, are, um, you have um, the right to exist in reality from your DNA, right? If you walk into a bank, the bank can say hello to you. They might not know your name. If they do know their name, they can greet you. Um, but we hope that we can do the same thing here on the internet. And so um, really, um, we want to convey that uh, we think that Internet 3 is the best way to implement zero trust. Now, is it hard to use? What do you do? Well, it's really simple. You download software. You double click it. Uh, it activates. And you're online. <laughs> That's the way it should be. So. Um, very simple to use. Uh, again, for embedded devices, we have a developer program that allows you to work with us to, uh, to uh, integrate Internet 3 into your device. And so um, in kind of one slide, you can see here that um, we have um, really for a plethora of, of different markets a solution um, to helping everyone connect. And so the real critical question now that we come to this, this juncture in our uh, time together in this, uh, this, one this one hour slot is really, well, this is great and all, but how do you guys make money? <laughs> you said it's a good. How much does it cost? What is, what is your business? And so we really think about um, kind of instead of, again, to reiterate, instead of having the internet become a service, we think it should be good. So we sell the uh, IP address um, one for a one-time cost, right? And um, you know, although uh, we don't have any kind of slides to it today, um, generally our idea is that uh, it'll be free for people uh, and we want to make money on the devices. 
if you look in the ceiling, there's a lot of lights, there's a lot of infrastructure uh, that is around us uh, and, and helps us get through the world. I think the term um, in the United States is operational technology. So a lot of people think of the internet as being a solution for IT, for information technology, but we think that the internet should go more towards um, the idea of operational technology. There's a lot of um, uh, infrastructure that apparently is gonna be hacked or hackable, right? We wanna, we wanna uh, help that, that um, to help to see that, that we're not hacked, that we're all secure and all secure and ready to um, utilize the um, infrastructure in ways that increases GDP. And so um, by selling the IP address for a one-time fee, um, it really helps us um, do two things. One is it helps the manufacturers take responsibility for the, the product. What does that mean? Uh, anyone who has ever bought an IP camera knows that when you buy the IP camera, you end up spending a lot of time setting up the IP addresses and doing all these different things. Whereas um, in the future, when the IP camera comes from the factory, it already has an IP address because it was generated at the factory. You know, you can write it on a label. You can put it on a QR code. There's no need to um, do any kind of setup because for the lifetime of the device, it's always the same IP address, which means it's trustworthy. And so, um, again, because the public key and the associated private key is generated inside the device, um, we don't have any control over that. We can't revoke that IP address, but what we can do is we can activate and bless the device. And what that means is that um, we associatively sign the, uh, the uh, key so that other nodes in the network knows that it's, um, it is actually you know, bought and paid for. And so uh, I, I like to use the, the term bless instead of activate because um, you can do the reverse of activation. You can deactivate something. It's really hard to unbless something. <laughs> Once it's blessed, it's blessed. So um, we like to use the term blessed. But the, the idea is that, again, um, to sell uh, the, uh, the, um, these IP addresses. That's our, our core market. We think there's about uh, a trillion devices in the world that might be available for Internet 3. So that is, uh, if you sell it for $1 per device, it's a trillion dollars. We think it's a huge market. And so to help us um, really uh, grow Internet 3, um, there's a number of core partners that we've been working with. Um, We've been very shy about um, who we work with at, the, at this current juncture um, because we have been, uh, haven't been really um, public in our, our activities. And so at IGF here, we're going to come forward. But now we have um, these collaboration partners, Omnimo, uh, KML Gates, and Mitsui and Company, who have been uh, fundamental in helping us navigate um, really what is going to be, hopefully, um, a huge juncture in how we um, communicate. And so I'd like to change gears now and hopefully um, kind of reiterate what we're doing. I mean, there's a lot of different things that I can talk about, but it's best to have um, really kind of these experts talking. So if I may, uh, can I ask Mr. Uh, Mr. Hishita to give some comments about the, oh, you've got your mic, okay, great, about Internet3, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, my name is Mitsuhiro Hishida. I am uh, uh, the Director General of the uh, MIC Japan uh, Hokuriku uh, Regional Office, uh, based in Kanazawa. Uh, actually, I, I, po, uh, came, uh, I am posted this uh, position since this July. Uh, until then, I was working for the uh, Global Strategy Bureau of the MIC, and, my, and uh, I was working for the global uh, negotiation like the G7. Last, the last, the last G7 was, by the way, held in uh, Takasaki in, in this, uh, this April. Well, at the G7 also, we talked about this, uh, the, the internet governance. Uh, we noticed that, that uh, there is some uh, gov government uh, uh, control over internet. Sometimes there's a government shutdown. There is sometimes government internet fragmentation. So the theme of this IGF is, uh, as you know, the internet we want. So what is in internet we want? As Chris mentioned, as to, for, uh, there, there is if they, they want, you, well, uh, if you want to do the, the IoT business, uh, you need to get free access to internet, and you need to have a secure uh, infra ICT infrastructure. Uh, 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 according to so according to what I heard from this Chris presentation, I understand that this uh, Internet three is an innovative new service that will enable the, the zero trust, and also it, it will uh, be the the secure, it will provide a secure uh, uh, IP address, 
uh, for the, the each IT, IoT devices. So I hope that uh, from the viewpoint of the Hokuriku Regional Office uh, Director General, uh, that such a new innovative survey should be first introduced in the Hokuriku Region's companies on, and also local enterprises, and so that they can show that this uh, new technology really is feasible and also can provide safe in access to internet. Uh, this is my uh, comment. Thank you very much. Okay, the clap. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So again, we've had a lot of support from the Hokuriku region. A lot of people don't know where Hokuriku is. It's kind of north of here and uh, a little uh, uh, west of, of uh, Nagoya and, and Tokyo. Um, but we like to think of it as Cyber Valley, the, the upcoming um, place where a lot of this innovation will take forward. So thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Hishita. So next, I want to kind of uh, switch gears to Mr. Uh, Katsusha uh, Sasaki, mayor of Sabai City. And thank you, Mayor, for coming so far out to Kyoto. And so um, again, uh, Sabai is a really core um, city in uh, the Hokuriku region. And so I'd like to hear some comments from uh, Mayor Sasaki. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Katsuhisa Sasaki, the mayor of Kui Prefecture, Sabai City. Sabai is a city no one went and basically I wear which make up over 19% of nationally produced grasses frame. Our city I, is also known throughout Japan for its SDGs 5, gender, equality, seven, sustainable development, any city. We believe that gender equality is a key to a prosperous future and strongly to be a sustainable city in which people can together flourish and take on new challenge. I am here to support Internet 3, which we can to survive as sustainability. Now, Samantha, from our resource center for implementation of SDGs, we address our Thoughts on sustainability and internet three. Samantha, do. Thank you, Mayor Sasaki. Um, before I start, I would just like to make one correction. The um, the uh, English coming out at the top of the screen said 19% of glasses for Sabaya. The number is over 90. <laughs> just wanted to make that distinction, sorry. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Samantha Kawaguchi. I am a Canadian based in Sabaya City. Much of my work focuses on the sustainable development goals. Um, within that, mostly um, goal number five, gender equality and other areas such as diversity and intersectionality. And today I have come here with the mayor to speak a little bit about how Internet3 correlates with Sabaya's initiative for the Sustainable Development Goals and how that um, implementing Internet3 is a great way to further sustainability in not just our city, but in other local cities very similar to our own. And before, I'd like, um, before I start, I would like to mention that Sabaya is um, a small city of about 70,000 people but it has greatly been considered one of the forefronts of the local SDGs initiatives. It's a role model city in especially regards to goal number five, gender equality. And this is for many reasons, but one of the big ones stems from Sabaya's history with women's empowerment. Unlike some of the other regions in Japan, Sabaya historically has seen many women involved in the workplace as well as in their family lives balancing career and child raising, which is something very specific to Sabaya and the Kukui region. And currently, women are still in the workplace, active as ever. Much of the women are involved in family-run businesses, which still to this day make up a great number of our local industries, such as glasses, glassware, and textiles. And it is for this reason that um, Sabaya uh, started being very particular in its 
SDGs, especially gender equality initiatives. And today, with the current environment of Tabaya being pretty different than other regions in Japan, where we have the uh, highest percent of pe uh, women, women excuse me, employed and women um, working as well as men working, so dual income households. So with this um, background, we spent a lot of time and strive to um, further not only gender equality, but all of the sustainable development goals. And some of the ways that we have done this is um, through uh, various initiatives that both the city and our local companies and industries engage in, such as um, we have a network that um, really promotes gender equality by bringing together leaders of our local businesses that have implemented um, policies within their workplaces to encourage gender equality. We encourage uh, per, uh, excuse me, parental, um, paternity leave, that's the word, paternity leave in both our public and private sectors. And we also celebrate many global milestones such as International Women's Day to spread more awareness of how gender equality is something very necessary to a sustainable society. society. And we feel that in Sabayat, Internet3 is a very, very important tool to not only um, doing more things towards gender equality, goal five from the SDGs, but also all of the other SDGs as well. As well. So this would um, work with all of the three pillars of um, sustainable development, such as the economic sector, the environmental sector, and the societal success, se excuse me, sector. So for example, with Internet 3, this, or Internet 3, excuse me, um, there would be no fees, which would make Internet way more accessible to a larger amount of people. So for example, there would be more e means to go online and access educational tools, and for people to be online without having to pay monthly costs would mean less barriers. So this would directly relate to SDG 4, 5, and 10. And that is on an individual level. On a consumer level, Internet 3 would relate to the SDGs by providing more ways for developers to get involved in actually developing and innovating towards new solutions rather than trying to rehash old things and trying to work more on security. So this would mean more inventions and this could um, really reframe the way that um, all of our companies and industries work, how our inner, our inner structure functions. This would uh, correlate to SDG 8, 9, and 11. And this is directly, indirectly, it has the potential to correlate with many other SDGs, such as poverty, healthcare, as well as areas uh, pertaining to environmental issues. And it is for this reason that um, we think that Internet 3 would also be a very, very key factor to um, digital peace online, because with Internet 3, everybody will have safe access to the Internet and this will allow for a digital democracy in which we can all focus on our human rights and our um, safety in order to use the internet in a way that was different than what we have um, used up until now. And it will be better for us on a, um, as humanity on a whole in order to access the internet. And this will pertain to SDG 16 for peace. And another huge factor in Internet 3 is SDG 17, because through global partnerships and local partnerships as well, everybody can come together to use this new type of Internet to have more access to a free virtual world. And this will be a great opportunity for everybody to come together and tackle much of the societal issues that we all face together as humanity. So Internet, as we all know, as everybody here knows especially, uh, internet is such a vital part of our lives. It really is an indispensable lifeline. And in regards to diversity and human rights, the internet is one of our rights. And we should be able to access it in a way that is free and is safe and is accessible to everybody. So it is for this variety of reasons that Internet 3 can be a great tool that can help survive sustainability. But not just our city. It can help many cities much like our own that are trying their best to deal with local issues and do their best towards global issues as well. So um, we hope here from Sabaya, a little city of 70,000, that 
our showcase of what we are doing and how Internet 3 can really speed up our sustainability process and help our town grow even more. We hope that this could have been a little hint for everybody listening and that you too can find something that Internet 3 can help you with. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Samantha. I, I think that, you know, obviously, um, Sabai is really important uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one, you know, it, it only has 70,000 people, but it's really what I think the model Japanese town. If Sabai, uh, if it can work in Sabai, it can work anywhere. And I really want to touch again on um, what Samantha was talking about with uh, uh, equality and women's, uh, uh, women's equality in, in the sense that um, through Internet 3, um, there's been um, different projects inside of the uh, city to help remotely connect to um, the Sabai City network. So what does that mean? It means that you know, if you um, need to be at home, especially uh, dur during COVID-19, it was very hard for um, people to connect into these networks, these governmental networks. And so we uh, were able to talk to the Ministry of um, uh, Internal Affairs and Communications to get the right checklist, the right guideline checklist to be able to use Internet 3 inside of a governmental setting. And that really changed it so that people could take their, um, they could use their laptops from home and connect into the la to the, their desktops and do the work from their home um, when they weren't able to before. So again, that really helps for um, child uh, uh, bearing and helping with, with the home uh, issues. And, and so uh, again, to reiterate, um, it's really great to hear from Savai City uh, today. So I'm gonna change gears a little bit. Um, I wanna introduce um, Mr. Hideshi Ta uh, Takanagi, who's uh, next to me. He's kind of a unique person. Um, he's from the Shintenoji Temple in Osaka. And um, he is um, kind of a very artistic person. And so I think that a lot of people think Sound. about um, I think a lot of people think about the internet and digital as being this kind of high-tech thing. And I really hope that Internet 3 can show that it integrates well with um, culture. And what that means is that a lot of people are still thinking kind of uh, what we would say in Japan is an, uh, kind of an analog method. And um, through uh, our relationship, um, he has kind of uh, helped, uh, helped me find that, that you know, digital can also really be um, connected to culture and connected back to um, really um, society in a very profound way. And so I'd like to, to ask, uh, ask him for, for a little comment here, yes. Yeah, uh, I'm real and now people, yeah. And, uh, thank you so much. Uh, now let me introduce myself. Is uh, I was born in a traditional Japanese family. I, was, uh, I played in the traditional Japanese entertainment I uh, played at the traditional uh, Japanese instruments. Uh, Japanese is uh, so, you know, it's a koto, yeah? yeah. It's, so it's a koto uh, I play. Uh, this is uh, the symbolic is a, uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just uh, no, no. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, it's something like that. Um, it's so. Uh, uh, but uh, I am. I am a new or uh, uh, new wave. I want a new wave. Yeah. I had uh, <laughs> the so I had bought a computer in 1977. Oh. Yeah. Uh, 1977. Yeah, all oh, the display in the so keyboard, display the Sony is the keyboard in the Yamaha, and uh, you saw uh, oh, oh, tape recorder, yes, oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah, what, 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 uh, <laughs> what to use, what to use, yeah, yeah, okay. and maybe uh, the 100 and in, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so and to be con uh, yeah so Japanese and as, uh, to be continued to as uh, step by step step by step as uh, so and uh, analog and uh, so digital in a combination yeah yeah to be continued yeah and uh, by the way is a Japanese uh, uh, situation yeah now Japanese situation economic situation is so bad what yeah. Yeah, as a uh, Tate, thank you so much. Is a what? And uh, to Japanese situation, economic <laughs> situation is a bad. Why? What? Uh, yes. It's so. Uh, <laughs> in uh, 1970, 1980. Yeah, no, no. 1960, 1970, 1980. Yeah. 
is the soul. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go, 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 go. About the 1990. Yeah. And the soul. 90 from 1999. Yeah. Mm. To now. Yeah. From 1999 <laughs> from to now. It's so. Uh, this is uh, what is what to say is uh, uh, thirteen blanks, thirty blanks, thirty uh, blanks. Why this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Thirty <laughs> <laughs> blanks, thirty <laughs> blanks. Uh, right. So kuhaku no sanju ren. Yeah. <laughs> So there's yeah. a 30, last, uh, the last oh, decade, right? Yeah. The last decade, as we would say, yeah. the last decade. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, I uh, can fit in a digital, yeah, to be continued from 1977. But uh, in Japan, uh, almost Japanese people and Japan cannot uh, settle into internet okay. and uh, s cannot set into uh, oh, digital, yeah? yeah. And uh, because it's so economic, it's uh, all most it's things is, uh, wow, wow, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think it's, I catch, um, I catch internet three. Thank you so much. <laughs> I got it in the street. Oh. Yeah? He got it. You think so? <laughs> he got it. And uh, I think uh, the <laughs> in the street is meaning is a last, uh, last uh, consciousness of human beings. Uh, consciousness is a human beings. Uh, Sartet Chris say is uh, internet three. Uh, its meaning is the last consciousness a uh, human being. Uh, we hope uh, Internet C create uh, Japan and uh, Japan and uh, so create a uh, world. Create is a new world. Uh, um, it is uh, possible for us uh, to create new world. Uh, Sir Tate Chris. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I think that everyone, you know, uh, we're trying, right? And I think that a lot of people, they're so uh, excited about this new idea of an internet that we can own together. Um, it connects, the internet connects us today, a lot of places, but it also connects us, it doesn't connect us. There's a lot of places on the earth that are not connected um, where it's important to um, bridge the gap, bridge connectivity, um, not only just in a technical means, but also um, in, you know, sometimes a spiritual mean uh, even. And so, um, you know, there's it's a, lot of, a lot of people, anybody can, uh, can join Internet3, and that's what makes it um, very special. So um, I want to, uh, let's see here, we switch, so we've got a TV spot. Maybe we can uh, kind of uh, slow things down here. I think, you know, just to kind of introduce the TV spot, um, We're really thinking about, you know, the, the name Connect Free. Our company's name is Connect Free. And um, just to give you kind of a perspective, I uh, grew up uh, in Seattle, Washington, uh, connected uh, to the Macintosh for the first time at three years old, got on the internet uh, at four, started writing uh, C uh, language at five with a uh, Think C interpreter. Um, Graduated early from high school at 15, went to Silicon Valley, got invested in by Ron Conway, uh, got into the scene there. So I went from Seattle to Silicon Valley, which is a big move to me. But um, I realized something, and that was at 19, and that was that a lot of the world didn't understand Japan, and still doesn't understand Japan. And growing up um, in Seattle, there was a lot of Japanese people around me, and I really wanted to understand why they weren't getting it. Why didn't people get Japan? And so, um, I, I, uh, I traveled to Japan at 19 because I just, uh, there was a lot of people in Silicon Valley that just didn't believe in Japan at the time, unfortunately. And so when I came to um, Japan, I asked them point blank, why, why don't you use the internet more? Why don't you use technology more? And just like um, we just heard, um, you know, the 1970s, 1980s, people really interested in technology, but when it came to the 1990s, they're really hard pressed to get in there. And so 
It was really about um, freedom and responsibility. So the Japanese people, after the war, um, the word freedom shows up in the Japanese constitution four, uh, 11 times in Japanese. And so it really forced the Japanese people to really think about what is freedom? What does it mean to be free? And their interpretation was to be 100% responsible. Um, and so um, we really think that that kind of changed me a lot as an American um, to really think about there's a, there's a lot of ways you could think about freedom. And so um, I realized that you know we could connect better. We could connect more free. And so that's where the name Connect Free uh, comes from. And so I want to put the, the TV spot on here to talk about a little bit how we, um, we think about freedom. Can we get more of the speakers? With that, I'd like to, uh, in today's, uh, uh, at least this, this portion of, of the talk, um, and um, Internet3, um, you, can, you can access it at internet3.net. And, um, you know, I, I think that we're starting something together today. You know, I, uh, I think that we still have maybe a few minutes of time here. We've got four minutes left here. So um, I want to open up and see if anybody wants to, you know, uh, kind of come forward and talk, if that's, what, uh, if that's uh, feasible. If not, um, we can see you back at our booth at number 39, and uh, I hope everyone has a great IGF. Thank you.